which now astronomers think may not exist. Please sit down. You probably need to switch it on. Uh, have you tried turning it off and on again? <laughs> okay, so um, I was I was asked to make an introduction, and uh, uh, Corey uh, evidently is uh, someone who does not need an introduction. So instead of the real introduction, I would like to tell you uh, uh, an, an anecdote. Um, uh, some of you probably know that two years ago there were big ACTA protests in Poland, and um, and uh, modern Poland was um, was from the very beginning uh, involved in uh, in in uh, organizing and uh, delivering uh, delivering know-how and so on and so on to the uh, uh, most uh, uh, important and uh, and most populous. Uh, um, protest, uh, protests um, in, the, in, the, in the history of, uh, uh, of, of Poland in the last 25 uh, years. And um, uh, one of the events we co-organized with um, uh, Kasia Szumielewicz and uh, Ludwig Wozniak was, um, uh, was a, 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 a meeting of organizers of the street protests. That meeting um, that took place in, in Warsaw, in, uh, uh, in Warsaw Polytechnic, um, and uh, and we invited and we invited uh, like more than hundred people from all over the Poland who were actively organizing the street protest against ACTA, and uh, uh, it was a very difficult meeting because. Uh, uh, some of those people were very critical towards us, and um, they were they were they were they were not trustful uh, toward the uh, uh, toward the uh, uh, well NGOs uh, who, who took part in it, and they, they, they thought that the bottom up movement was something real, and um, uh, and we uh, it, it was so it was difficult, and we, we had a difficult time communicating what our uh, what our goals are and. Um, and uh, what we want to achieve with them, and uh, how we want to support them, and um, the, also most of those people were uh, were very very. I mean, they they, they 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 began from the protest, and just after that, began began to to, to think and to analyze what this ACTA protests, what is what ACTA is all uh, all about, and uh, one of the tools, um, uh, and so and we wanted to to put that in a perspective, and we we were we were worried that. That we will be unable to communicate properly with those people that what the perspective is, and we decided that the right thing to do is to buy a book for all of them, and that book was a little brother oh. uh, by Corey. I I I, I got to, I, I I I got to the web to, to the publisher's website, and uh, I um, and, uh, I, and I, I found that the book is be, is being sold. Uh, uh, in uh, at a discount if you buy a certain amount of it, so we bought more than hundred copies wow. of, <laughs> of That's little, very nice. Thank you. Of little brother, and and uh, and 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 handed it out to uh, to those people. And um, uh, and as far as I know, uh, they really and those were really young people. I mean, they, they were people in, uh, in higher secondary school. Um, so the, it was it was the, uh, it was the target audience, I believe, and um, so so um, so the, so the, uh, uh, thank you for, for thank you for being with us um, uh, today. Uh, I'm really proud that uh, we published um, uh, the book uh, Context, which is the book on writing the uh, the, the books. Uh, uh, which which shape the world and shape uh, the minds and shape the shape the, the vision of the world and uh, it's very kind of you thank you yeah that's that's very kind of you thank you I'm honored thank you <laughs> so this is so this is the anecdote and uh, Corey does not need introduction the other guy does not need <laughs> Does not need introduction either. Uh, this is for, for 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 those of you who who still don't know. This is Wojciech Orlinski, and uh, his um, uh, and, uh, and we cooperate with Wojciech for a long time. And he's uh, there's a, there's a, there's a, there's an English word for that. This is competition. So I mean, he's the friend we love to hate, or he's the enemy we love to befriend. 
<laughs> and um, as you know, and some of you follow follow uh, follow the the, the, the the Facebook walls of uh, either me or Wojciech. So, so those of you who do know that we love to to, to to flame each other and troll each other and so on and so on and so on. So I hope this uh, so I, I hope this meeting will be really um, uh, really interesting. Uh, and it was one last organizational note, if you want to buy a book, it's possible and um, uh, over there you can, you can do this and hopefully then you can back uh, uh, Corey for uh, uh, signature. Uh, anything to make a book non-returnable. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, Wojciech, this is, uh, I believe you, uh, you, you need to start the real, the real talk. And, and Wojciech, thank you for coming along to this. This can't be, it, it's never easy to be the, the dissenting voice in front of a crowd, so I hope everyone will. Actually, it's easier because at least, at least you know what to say. Uh, like, he's, he, he jump started, I, I wouldn't know when, when to begin with, because I don't know if you want to talk about your life as a writer or your life as a social activist, and Little Brother is a good, is a good beginning because it, it allows you to, to speak about both. I would, I, I would say that Little Brother it, little brother, because it's it's kind of dated. It's also there's a lot of optimism about about free software in there, which I don't think you would repeat it today. Especially after all we know about about first of all the known backdoors in free software that which turned out that they exist as well. Although Sorry, it, backdoors or flaws? Well, <laughs> what, what what they found in Bash, I would say. Oh well, that's not a backdoor. That's a flaw. <laughs> ah. <laughs> no, 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 no. There's a huge difference, right? A backdoor is something someone intentionally hid. And a flaw is a mistake someone made. I don't think anyone. I mean, is there anyone who who argues seriously that um, uh, shell shock was a deliberately introduced? Uh, now now we're entering the famous. Uh, what you said sounds almost like it's not a bug; it's a feature. Like no, 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 no. I just think that um, if you're going to do so, security only exists in rel in relation to something else. There's no such thing as abstract security, right? Um, and so, if you're going to be secure one of the things you have to be able to do is model the threat. And if your threat is human error, that's a totally different threat model with a completely different set of responses to malicious sabotage. I don't question that there's human error. Uh, I think, but if you're seeing there's back doors, which, uh, you know, one of the Snowden revelations is that there are actual back doors in other technologies, for example, uh, um, the RSA introduced, deliberately weakened its security and I think that you would agree that that is a that is a in terms of how we address that technological problem to attain security, there is a foundational difference between uh, a company deliberately weakening security and someone making a mistake in terms of how you remediate it, guard against it, and prevent it in the future. Right? Well, but I would say that for for the average uh, user of technology like like me or Yarek or even probably you, it actually boils down to 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 the very simple rule that you're not secure, you're never secure. And uh, if they're after you, they will get you using this bug or this back door or this. Well, uh, so let me let me actually go back one step and first of all say that I I don't think that there's anything unique about free and open source software that it has long live defects in it. And I I I suspect the reason we haven't found it about long live defects in Windows is because they don't tell us about them. Not because not because they're not there. It's, it seems implausible that there's that the free software methodology produces defects where the other one doesn't. I think the, the main difference is who gets to inspect it. Uh, security, as I say, is not a, an abstract property. Security is, uh, is in relation to one thing or another, right? You are secure, well, I am secure relative to you. You are secure relative to the state. The state is secure relative to another state. There is no abstract of security. For one thing, um, my security relative to the state might be insecurity for the state relative to me. The inability of the state to, to know what I'm saying or thinking might weaken its security against me if I'm plotting its downfall. So you can't be just secure. You can only be secure from a thing. In terms of the post-Snowden world, the thing that I think has many people up in arms is not the knowledge that when spies target someone, they can figure out a way to get to them. It's the knowledge that the incremental cost of surveilling anyone, regardless of whether or not they're someone who has any likelihood of ever doing anything bad, is effectively zero. That once PRISM is installed, each new Gmail user costs nothing to spy on. And that the response of people who are anxious about PRISM is not to make everybody as spy-proof as Edward Snowden. Edward Snowden clearly has very good operational security and thus far has managed to do something that I think most of us would find very hard, which is to like not 
have all of his communications totally pwned and splashed all over the front page of every newspaper. That's, that's, no one anticipates that when the, uh, the, the lighthouse beam of the NSA falls on you that the average person is going to be able to stop. But I think what many of us would like is for the cost of surveilling a new person to be somewhere between one and ten thousand dollars. And if the cost of surveilling a new person is between one and ten thousand dollars, then the intelligence services need to figure out who is likely to be suspicious and only spy on people who are likely to be suspicious. And at that point, the rule of law is much easier to bring to bear because one of the things that intrinsically limits the rule of law is the, technical poss the technically possible. And so by changing the technically possible, we will change what, what the rule of law looks like. But, but my pessimism comes uh, more from, 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 the, from the fact that theoretically, of course, you can make yourself even more expensive to spy on, but uh, the, 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 cost, the, the cost for you will be even higher because in order to be secure, you have to basically exclude yourself from a normal life. Like Probably simply to come to Poland, you have to do various insecu total insecure uh, things just to get boarded on, on, on plane. And probably just because we were supposed to meet, meet here, all of us, we have our smartphones in our pockets, so they know, and it's very easy for them to, to, to know that we are all three in the same building. So I would put it to you that you're still using security in a way that is imprecise and that fails to make any kind of, uh, that, that fails to make the argument intelligible. Because when you say I've done things that are insecure, you're right, I've done things insecure if I'm Edward Snowden, right? If I, if I want to silently traverse the European Union without being intercepted and rendered to Syria, I have completely failed. My operational security is completely not up to it. But if what I'm worried about is having the whole of my life, not things that are secret, but things that are merely private, and there's a significant difference, right? Like I know what you do in the toilet, but you don't do it in front of me, right? It's not a secret, it's just private. For having privacy, knowing that my conversations, my casual conversations are not recorded, knowing that um, at every turn my location is not being logged, knowing that um, my, uh, uh, knowing that, you know, the, the elements of my life that are mine are not uh, being logged without my permission, that that is actually a pretty attainable goal without exact, I mean, I've done it, right? I, I, I do it already. Like my conversations with a lot of people that I need to converse with that are often sensitive, but sometimes not, are now in encrypted ephemeral channels that are encrypted using very well audited technologies um, that are likely to be secure from casual attacks, although not <coughs> attacks like key logging where someone has physically gained hardware access to my machine, not secure from things like people putting a, an optical bug in my house, but, lo but secure from bulk surveillance. And I think that I've attained that, and I've attained it without becoming a hermit. Hmm. But wait a minute. Like uh, actually, Yarek, uh, he he's using uh, now uh, PGP uh, with his with his email. But but of course he can use it only with peop other people who use, who do the same. And I just to piss him off really, I I I, I refuse to do that. And we communicate usually right. by Facebook messages, which is the, the worst, the absolute worst. Yeah, and sure. I do it on purpose. I, I yeah. admit it because yeah. I, I am a mischievous uh, right. little devil after all. So 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 maybe you're not a hermit, but in order to just have forty friends who will use it, you will you have to look for them quite a long time and then still you can have one annoying arrogant person like me who will refuse it just just to piss you off you sure know. no i understand that yeah i mean <laughs> so so prior to the stone revelations there was not a lot of demand for privacy tools from people who weren't already very technically sophisticated because understanding as we now i think have a very widespread understanding of the way that atomized bits of data are joined up to make pictures of you that are either accurate in a way that's compromising or what's even worse is inaccurate in a way that's compromising. You know, Cardinal Rishi Lu said, if you give me six lines in the hands of an honest man, I'll find in them a reason to hang him, right? <laughs> that, that now we, now that there's, there's a great awareness of this and there's some statistical evidence to back this up. The Pew Internet Life Project, which does these uh, widely respected, very rigorous uh, analyses and surveys of American attitudes towards the internet found that three months after the Snowden revelations, 87% of Americans took an affirmative step to protect their privacy, none of which was any good, right? All they did, everything they did, sucked. But I, that's because there is no tool that is civilian usable that does anything meaningful. And all the tools that are civilian usable, if they have a thing that purports to give you privacy, it doesn't. 
you know, the only thing worse than being insecure is thinking you're secure and being insecure, right? Like, not knowing your car's brakes don't work is much worse than driving a car with brakes that don't work and, and knowing you don't know. it. Yeah. So, um, but I, I'd like you to think back to the days before desktop publishing. And before desktop publishing, all the software for setting type assumed that you were a typographer. It was extremely technical. And I, I used to work in prepress, right? It was impossible to use unless you were already a typographer. Unless you could set uh, type with, a, with a, a litho machine, you couldn't set type with a computer. Desktop publishing assumed that somewhere out there was a, a, a largely unforeseen audience of people who wanted to do something fancier than a, what you could do with a typewriter but less fancy than what you would do if you were a highly skilled typographer. And they set themselves the, at the time, very improbable project of making something that would allow you to do 95% of what a typographer could do. There's still a critical 5%. It's the Snowden 5%, right? It's the 5% that's the difference between the flyer that gets sent home for your kid's fun fair and a sign like the poster for this event, which is a beautiful piece of type, right? And when 87% of Americans want a product that no one is selling them, people are willing to invest, both in the private and the, the foundation side, in trying to see, working on the hypothesis, that the reason that security technology is abstruse is not because it is irreducibly technical, but because 100% of the demand, give or, sake, give or take a percentage, has been from people who are already technologically knowledgeable. Mm -hmm. And I think that this is an empirical question, and I've invested in it, and I've joined the board of a foundation called Simply Secure that's trying to make highly usable front ends. It's staffed by some of the best uh, people from some of the best security uh, uh, usability labs in the world, and the product is not just front ends. We're building front ends for things like um, uh, uh, the chat program, uh, OTR off the record, but also we're, we're documenting the process to build a, a, a replicable toolkit for uh, assessing and, re and refining usability and security tools. So we'll see. We'll see whether or not that's possible. But I think that it's not implausible to say that it might be possible. But actually, this is one of, one of uh, our, our, our constant flame wars between me and, and, and Jarek, uh, is, is that I, I, I like very much your metaphor about the, the danger, of, danger of driving the car that has no brakes and you don't know it. That's, that's yeah. more dangerous. And I think free software advocates for decades were actually misleading public opinion, saying that being secure is very easy, being private is very easy. Just use this, just use that. And actually, his foundation has documents like that on their website. Just do this, just do that, and you're secure. And I always say, bullshit, you're not secure. They, because, uh, well, for, no, and I, was, I had a lot of arguments, a lot of points. And probably your startup will never openly say to the public, because then we alienate the public, that one of the points to make it working is cut off relationship with all the friends who don't use this technology because once sure. you have one friend who's still on Facebook, you either have uh, you, need, you need a completely different computer to, to, to communicate, oh, maybe virtual machine or something like that, but you, you can need a different system to talk to him because once, once, once you talk to him on Facebook, once you mail him, your, 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 all your mails that you send to him will be known to everybody who, who spying on him. And with those mails, all, all the metadata like, 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 like your IP and so on, it will be still there. So, I think you're making an unwarranted assumption. Like I can, cons I can certainly conceive of a way that I could, you know, in a very abstract, highly technical way, I could sketch it on a whiteboard that you could build a system, for example, that when you went to Facebook, logged you into Facebook, but then uh, no, saw that you were on Facebook and communicating with that person, and then when you left Facebook, uh, refused to show your cookie in a third-party way to other websites that would track you around the web. And again, I'm, I'm not pretending that this is easy. I'm just saying that this is automatable, right? If that use case is actually important, that use case can be built. And then uh, I can also imagine that we can do mail, and in fact, there are projects underway, underway that the uh, uh, LavaBit and Phil Zimmerman are both working on protocols for email that hide headers, that hide IP addresses, and that make the metadata more obscure. And so that social graph that you can build by sitting in the middle of the network gets harder. I also think that normatively, that when 87% of people have suddenly woken up to privacy, that normatively it's easier for us to also bring legislative pressure to bear on the security services, which you actually see happening in many jurisdictions. And uh, commercially, firms are becoming more skeptical about doing things like BT profiting by letting uh, uh, GCHQ do deep fiber taps that are how they gathered all those email headers, that all these things are actually working to make the uh, social graph of people who are secure 
more more <laughs> obscure. Particularly, you know, I, I, I was just on this big book tour. I, I have two new books out, and I was in 21 cities in 31 days. And one of the interesting things is you say people are more awake to security now, and like there's no substitute for this, right? So going around from city to city, a whole ton of people, it was really weird, sat down with me and said, can I just have a word with you over here? We're going to leave our phones over there. Just come over here for a minute. And told me all kinds of stuff that they wanted to have investigated in more depth. And I then relayed this out to other people. And one of the ways that I, and, and so what I found often when I talk to people who are um, uh, journalists who work routinely with high security environments, they don't use email for this stuff at all. They're like, we need to set up an OTR session because we don't log, there's no logging, there's no headers, and our IP addresses are obscured, and the fact that we're talking to each other is obscured. So I'd open a PGP email with them, and they'd say, I'm not talking about this with you in email. We have to go to a place where there's no logging, right? So in fact, the people on that side are already thinking this through, and so the idea that it's all or nothing is, I think, wrong. I think the, the idea that you can have porous boundaries between parts of your life is at least conceivable. I agree that we're very bad at maintaining uh, the facets of our identity in a digital world, that it's hard for you to have a digital life that faces your parents and another one that faces your kids and another one that faces whatever. But in part, that's due to the fact that social media hates that model. Right? Like Mark Zuckerberg says, if you do one thing in one domain and another thing in the other domain, you don't want the two to know about it, then you're two-faced. Eric Schmidt said, if you're doing something you don't want people to know about, maybe you shouldn't be doing it. Eric Schmidt, who has a secret entrance to his house so people can get in and out without the paparazzi see him. Mark Zuckerberg, who spent $40 million buying the two houses on either side of his house so that no one could go into any of those houses and point a lens at his house, said this, right? Well, I, I think that it's hard to do it, but it doesn't get easier when there's billions being spent on making it harder. One of the things I, 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 I find interesting in what you do is not the, you know, I mean, we can, we can talk for ages on what, what it means to be secure and how to secure your security and so on and so on. But one of the things I, 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 you are doing is you are, you are, active, you are, being, you are an educator. And a uh, big part of your work is to actually put fun into it. Mm -hmm. And uh, this is and um, and uh, so uh, I so my question I mean one of the things I I, 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 I of the ideas I had after reading Little Brother and uh, and uh, was uh, what is the social structure uh, which could carry uh, carry the fun not the security but the fun of security and it will and it will and the only I could I could think of was digital scouts. I mean, mm -hmm. to put that fun into scouting movement. Could you could you see yourself as a uh, as a as a as a modern day Baden Powell <laughs> leading, <laughs> leading thousands of digital scouts? No, but I would certainly blog a modern day modern, modern uh, by Baden Powell if he wanted to crop up. I mean, there are things like like maker spaces for kids that do a lot of this stuff, and in fact, scouts are starting to do more of this stuff. Um, in in Toronto, where I'm from, there's a place called MakerKids.ca. And they've worked out all kinds of ways to ease kids into technical literacy that I find really amazing. So when you get to Maker Kids, there's a huge stack, like a shelf, of cheap, crappy electronic and non-electronic toys, mostly electronic toys, uh, you know, robots and dolls and stuff that do things. And there's also a machine shop and a wood shop. And if you can take apart, you can take any of those toys and you can take them apart. Uh, and that's the first thing they do is they just give you screwdrivers and saws and knives and whatever, right? Little kids. And they oversee them as they do it. And the rule is that if you put it back together with other stuff in a way that it's no longer recognizable as the original toy, then it's yours and you can take it home. And I've watched little kids go through this exercise. It is a perfect induction exercise into the, uh, into the uh, again, like this is the, the IKEA principle. You know, when you put something together yourself, you value it more highly than if you buy it pre-made, right? In the, in the old days when they sold cake mixes, it was they were just add water, and people didn't like them. And then they took the powdered egg out so that you had to crack an egg into it. And the act of cracking an egg into a cake mix made you feel like you had some of your labor invested in it, right? And 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 the sales went up. And the, this is the you know there are all these behavioral economic experiments where you ask people what something that they put some work into is worth, they value it more highly than an identical product that they didn't put work into. And it also leads to all kinds of things that get us into trouble, like sunk cost fallacy, where you've spent some money or time doing something that's like you should abandon, but you're like, well, I've, I've gotten this far, I can't stop now. I, every programmer who's ever chased a bug instead of starting over 
knows what the what the sunk cost fallacy looks like. But it's I think that it's that that um, education is often about taking these human proclivities and finding ways to use them to our benefit. And just the same way that you know we can have bad habits and good habits. And one of the ways to become better at the things that you love is to make them habitual. Uh, because habits themselves are not bad, it's just bad habits that are bad. But I actually like the, the metaphor of, of, of Boy Scouts because uh, I would probably say the same, but with a sarcastic smug. Because I, 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 I'm not, because I, I don't know about how it is in English, but in Polish, Polish we often use, at least I often use, that something is, is, is like for the Boy Scouts, you know, it's, it's, not, it's not the adult stuff, because the, the basic principle is that the adult life is different. Uh -huh. And what you said about, uh, when you said that uh, Theoretical system that would protect your privacy would uh, somehow automatically log you in and log you out of Facebook, but Mark Zuckerberg will notice that. And once your system gets more popular, he will just cut it off in one way or, more or another. Just like you know, Google Books, first they often those various previews to various people. Uh, so people started to write scripts which download the whole books from various IPs and they seem to block it. Uh, it's. Uh, I, I mean, they're not just waiting for you to invent a technology that will re re regain your privacy. They want to steal from you, and they will always be one step ahead of you. In your, I, I was reading your novel Homeland after the Snowden revelations, and again, I, I for me, your 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 protagonists were Boy Scouts in this sarcastic way, like like they are trying to be secure from the system. They invent various ways, but. I, Especially after what we know after Snowden, we know that it's it's actually hopeless what they're trying to do. They they trying to make fake identities on Twitter so they could because they need social media to start a revolution. But I mean, if, I always say if if, if your if your revolution is going to to it need, requires corporations, your revolution is bound to fail before it even starts because they will be always one step ahead. So uh, I I think uh, well so I think that you've misread Snowden for one thing. I think one of the revelations of Snowden is that there are limits to the power, right? I mean, this is the, the, not, not least Snowden himself demonstrates that there are limits to the power of the surveillance apparatus. Um, and, uh, you know, one of the things that Snowden told us when he came in out of the cold is that crypto is intact. The reason that Bull Run and Edge Hill exists, they're spending a quarter billion dollars a year on Bull Run and Edge Hill, is to sabotage implementations of crypto because they can't break the crypto. I think your example of crawling Google Books and logging yourself in and out of Facebook are actually two different, really different threat models. So with Google Books, what's happening is Google is detecting a thing that you are doing to its service, which is that you are re making repeated requests. <laughs> and but they block the model that you're talking about with Facebook would be that Facebook would somehow have to know that a, that a visit that it couldn't see, right? That when you went to a website where you never fetched Facebook's cookie, that somehow you had been to that website and hadn't fetched its cookie, they would somehow have to divine that. And th that's the difference between you changing something at your end to make you secure from them, and them observing something you were doing at their end to make them secure from you. Those are really different threat models. And in the one instance, Facebook actually has to know where you're going without tracking you, which is the, the contradiction in terms. Absolutely not. They always, I mean, even if, even if the, the fact that you locked off Facebook doesn't make you invisible to Facebook, they still see you simply by, by the I like it button, which you will find everywhere. Well, no, 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 but that's my point, is the I like it button only shows you to Facebook if you're logged into Facebook. No, they, it's, it's another cookie which still traces you. They, no, 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 that, that's my whole point. Is if your if your browser refused to send Facebook a cookie, right? To refuse to fetch and refuse to send and refuse to receive or set a cookie on an I like it button. In fact, this is a huge opportunity. So you know when um, when Obama was running for the White House uh, the first time around, two thousand and eight, and two thousand in the two thousand seven election cycle, he used YouTube to do these kind of uh, uh, fireside chats. You know, like the like the, the Rooseveltian fireside chats uh, that were super powerful for him to, to reach his base. They, they bypassed the media and he was able to directly talk to people. When he got to the White House, he wanted to continue them. But there was a problem, and the problem was that um, the uh, uh, White House's own privacy rules precluded them gathering information about people who visited the White House's website. They actually got into trouble recently because they had a, like a Drupal plugin that started doing this and they, 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 didn't, they hadn't turned it off and they got into all kinds of trouble for it. Like, we can detect when they're tracking us, right? And so, Google was actually really anxious that the President of the United States go on using its products. 
And so they offer this thing, which is a no cookie version of YouTube. That's an untrackable YouTube version, right? It's a non-tracking YouTube version, where as a matter of policy and law, as well as a matter of technology, and remember it's law, technology, code, and norms, they don't track you, right? So we actually changed a corporate behavior through a combination of markets and, and code and law. Um, when the NHS rolled out I like it buttons on NHS Direct, which is the National Health Service in the UK has a list of all the diseases, right? Mm -hmm. So if you look up, obviously you don't want Facebook knowing when you look up non-gonococcal urethritis, mm -hmm. right? Like that's your own frigging business. But you do want, if you go and you see a button about smoking cessation, if you see a, a page about smoking cessation during smoking awareness week, you might want to actually push that out to your social network and click I like it. What happened was when the NHS put that put the I like it buttons on everything, they gave they put beacons on all those web pages. Conceptually, there's no reason to have those beacons. Like I have those beacons, I have I like it buttons on my books that don't send any information to Facebook until you click them. Because I host the the graphic locally and the script isn't called until you click it. Right? There's no reason you couldn't build that. In fact, that's how the Twitter I like it button works, right? It, it then it passes an argument to a Twitter API that then load, preloads a Twitter field. So you only log into Twitter when you click the tweet this button, but not when you see the, the tweet this button. You can force that behavior on the browser side, right? The browser can see, oh, this is, I'm loading a, a Facebook I like it button. Instead of doing that, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to show a local graphic that calls the script if you click it but not until, which gives you both, right? It gives you the power. So right now, Facebook's story is, well, you, when you give us information, we give you back a service. But the reality is, we take all of your information, we give you as little service as you want. You can, on the client side, change some of this so that you actually give them the service. Now, what's interesting is that when the only world that we have is the world where Facebook takes whatever they want, then it's really hard to argue that anything else is possible. You get into an argument like this one. When there are two populations, one of whom are actually doing what Facebook says they're doing, which is they give Facebook information to get a service back, and the other one is just getting plundered by Facebook, the policy debate looks different too, right? What Facebook is, Facebook's claim that they are giving and, and taking in a free exchange totally changes if they start to block people who are in fact enforcing giving and taking as a free exchange, right? It starts with both, it starts with a tech, technological change, but technology doesn't solve it. Technology changes what's possible in a political and a commercial sphere as well. But I, I, I like it that you are at least pessimistic in a way that you don't believe uh, those corporations at face value. That, but, sure. but I immediately jumped when you said that Google offered a no trace version of yeah, YouTube yeah. because I, I won't believe them. I mean, because apart from Cookie, Cookie is only one of dozens of course. Of yeah, no, no, they no, can no. fingerprint and browse it. If you use Flash, you're screwed at right. all. And no, probably no. that non transferable YouTube was probably Flash based. Yeah, no, 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 I understand. Well, so actually, it's H264 videos in the, in the no cookie. Okay. Uh, uh, YouTube, but the 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 point is that Google now technologically uh, has had to make covenants about not tracking that. They can lie. They can blatantly lie, and but they cannot control the, it. the incremental value to Google of being able to tell you whether of being of tracking your viewing of those videos, they would have to have so much. Like basically, everybody in the world would have to stop watching real YouTube and only watch non-tracing YouTube in order for it to be worth their money against, as against any rational calculus of the penalty that they would pay if they were caught lying, right? Because they, they, um, they, they are in a, in a highly regulated zone, which is providing services to the administrative branch of the United States, where they have had to make certain covenants about their data tracking stuff, and where the compliant, la failure to comply has really big legal teeth. And this is, again, a great example of how technology, law, norms, and code can work together, or uh, norms and markets can work together to change the picture. I often say that like there's this huge low-hanging fruit for activists that we've yet to really explore, which is insurers, right? Um, insurance underwriters right now treat all data handling practices as, as equivalent, right? If, so if you gather, if you have a website that has no reason for people to log in, but you make them log in in order to use it, like Quora, for example. There's no reason that you should have to log in to look at Quora, but Quora requires you to log in. You are effectively offloading the liability for your inevitable PII leak, because as you say, as against a, a very focused attack, there is no hope of, of being secure. The inevitable leak of huge amounts of PII from, from Quora 
has been offloaded to its insurer because that leak will be attended by both regulatory fines and private causes of action against them for the leaks, depending on its extremeness. That insurer should be sitting down with every one of its, its underwriters should be sitting down, and they will soon, should be sitting down with every one of the, the companies they underwrite and going, so tell me about your data handling practices. Like, wh who do you gather information from? Do you encrypt it? Do you salt? Right? The fact that insurers don't, at this point, have anyone working for them who knows the difference between storing logins and passwords, storing encrypted logins and passwords, and storing encrypted logins and passwords with good salts uh, is not an irremedi ir ir irremediable circumstance, right? That's one hire. You hire a CTO, and, now you, and, and that person can start working out those guidelines for you. And as soon as that happens, everybody who's got crappy data handling processes starts paying an extra million dollars a year on their insurance plan, and that completely changes things. Again, technology, code, norms, and law, and, uh, uh, um, or technology, markets, code, and law can, can work together to change these things. But from my pessimistic point of view, uh, the, 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 the legal threat to corporation actually is not as, as, as high as you said. Maybe Google is afraid of, of White House because no White House, after sure. all, is, is, is White House. But they, they will never be afraid of Everett Joe because uh, from my analysis, it looks like all those corporations, they are in a very convenient like, legal limbo. They can say that the American <laughs> companies, uh, when it fits them better, they can send the European when they want to have their taxes in the EU. And they say from Bermuda, we from Bermuda, when they actually have to pay taxes. So, so right now, for instance, Google or Facebook, te theoretically, they are European because they, they make business in Europe, but, but they, 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 the, the, the privacy laws are according to US where, where there's actually none, and they have this safe harbor policy that the actually European Union agreed to, so they can always say, we are American, you can touch us, you cannot control us, and I don't believe, you know, I, I, I don't think I will ever see in my life uh, any kind of legal proceeding against Google or against Facebook or against Twitter. On, on. So I think you're conflating uh, tax liability privacy liability and civil liability as a single package, and they're no, not. No, no. They, 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 they use the same trick to, to, to bypass. Oh, no, 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 so they have assets though, right? Like, it's not like, so if for that to work, right, if I had a legal cause of action against Google, and, and this is where like, I'm not an American, but I think Americans get something right that everyone faults them for, which is uh, uh, no win, no fee, plaintiff side lawyers which, you know, everyone's like, oh, Americans sue about everything. They get hot coffee and they sue because they spilled it on their lap. This is a thing that Americans get totally right. Like the woman who spilled the coffee on her lap, that McDonald's had been warned something like 800 times to turn down the heat on its coffee machine. They had burned innumerable people. The jury awarded the award. The judge did not give it to the woman who was burned. They kept it as an administrative fine. And no McDonald's in America serves coffee that's so hot that it will give you three de third degree burns that'll go through to the bone anymore, right? This is the reason American cars don't explode on low, low velocity impact anymore, is because you have ambulance chasers who figured out how to sue them. Now it creates its own set of problems. But in America, if you win a lawsuit against Google, it's not like Google will say, I'm sorry, our American bank accounts are empty, right? They don't have that option. Tax liability is totally different because what they're saying is our profits were made here and that money was never repatriated. But that's not to say, which I agree is totally bullshit. And you know, Google is obviously not headquartered in the middle of the Irish Sea, right? Like clearly this is not the case, right? I've been to the Plex, that's where they're located. They have a lot of money there. They're making a big payroll in America every week of every month of every year. And you can, you can make Google hurt. You can make them bleed with a big award against them you can, in America. You cannot, it's not going to happen. I mean, it's not the Julia Roberts blockbuster picture. Things like that don't happen. But in the, the Julia reality. Roberts blockbuster picture really happened. No, it did not really happen. <laughs> no, it really did. No, Aaron Brockovich no, really no. did win multi-million dollar settlements over hexavalent chlorine dumping. Time, and they really did stop hexavalent chlorine but dumping as a result. the story looks completely different. Anytime you watch a Hollywood picture, it's course. based on real events. It's but Aaron Brockovich did amazing stuff. Aaron Brockovich actually did uh, totally take make bleed companies with bad uh, toxic waste handling practices and did in fact change the way toxic waste handling practices work. Now, one of the ways that they changed 
was that states immunized, in some cases, immunized pe companies from liability for it. That's totally true. Because okay. this, is, this is the case of Google and Facebook and so on. They are immunized and they so, will be even worse. If, so they are not yet immunized because they haven't won these, the, there haven't been these big damages. And whether or not they would be immunized Google? remains to be seen. Yeah, abs Google, Google loses loss, civil lawsuits all the time, right? And, and they will continue to lose civil lawsuits. And sometimes they actually lose civil lawsuits where they plan on losing them or civil actions where they plan on losing them, like with the Authors Guild, which was a, a ridiculous thing, which is back to Google Book Search. Uh, you know, Google. So depending on, on which side of this you believe, right? Google said, well, we don't want to argue that scanning books and indexing them is fair use because that is, um, we might lose, right? It'd take a long time, we might lose. Uh, we would much rather settle with the Authors Guild, get a settlement out of the Authors Guild and, and, and you know, agree it was $70 million on behalf of all the authors. And, and if you're cynical, and I'm sort of cynical about this, if you're cynical, then you say, what Google said was, if we win a fair use defense on this, then anyone can index books. If we take a $70 million license from the Authors Guild, then only we can index books. And that's a much better way for us to handle it. But one way or the other, the Authors Guild got, got until the court struck down the settlement, a $70 million uh, piece out of Google, right? It's, it is absolutely true that the threat of civil litigation changes Google's behavior. Now, some of the civil litigation that Google has won has been bullshit, right? Like when, um, uh, 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 the uh, a company that owns Comedy Central, um, uh, Viacom? Via Viacom, Viacom came after Google, tried all the way to the Supreme Court to say that Google should have a lawyer review for copyright infringement all the material that goes on YouTube and Blogger and everywhere else before it's made available to the public and that that's really what the DMCA says and even if it's not, it's what natural justice demands, which is just bullshit, right? I mean, that, that, that's no way that that could exist. You would, you would run out of lawyers before you reach the heat death of the universe. It's crazy, right? Um, and then they said offering a privacy feature for YouTube, like letting people flag a video as private, was tantamount to abetting piracy, made you a, a party to piracy because you could pirate videos by making them private and then letting all your friends in and then their enforcement bots couldn't see them. So like, I shouldn't be allowed to have a private video because it might be a Hollywood movie. Again, total bullshit and, Go and Google wiped up the floor with them. But that doesn't mean that Google never loses. Google loses all the time. And, the, and when they don't lose, it's because they're careful. Uh, but where they, but they, they are certainly vulnerable to, to you know, losing really big, uh, and I think that they that that um, in fact, uh, insurance plus plus civil litigation is a great way, one great way out of many, to shift their burden, especially in the world that we live in now, which, as you say, is a world in which the legislatures overwhelmingly favor big companies, not just internet companies, oil companies, banks, uh, you know, all the all the major industries that have become so consolidated really get a sweetheart deal from the state as befits our relationship with them. And, you know, this is why having different branches of government, administration, judiciary, and legislature works. You know, when the, when the legislature becomes dysfunctional and captured, you can, you can use the judiciary to move what the legislature won't. So we began from uh, we began at security and we, 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 we discussed uh, in depth uh, how to make Google go bankrupt? Well, and no. How to, how to use the threat of bank? <laughs> how to use the threat of bankruptcy to scare Google into better tactics? Yeah, I mean, I just trying. To, I was just trying to joke. But right. anyway, <laughs> I'm sorry. But anyway, anyway, uh, anyway. Oh, but one. Uh, but I, I would like to get get a little bit back to the to your book. Uh -huh. and one one third of the context is about uh, you uh, trying to squeeze out. Uh, money out of the system, mm -hmm. and you know how to how to how to be a successful writer in a in a, in a, in a digital world, and uh, one of the and uh, and we we put a lot of effort in in discussing uh, uh, in the framework of the of the, of the copy camp and uh, and our mm -hmm. engagement in in uh, uh, in uh, in, uh, in the in the debate on the on the, the future of copyright, discussing uh, okay so what is what's what it means to be a good distribution channel from the privacy point of view and uh, mm. and we got to the point where uh, we're basically uh, uh, I mean buying is spying and uh, yeah. and no matter what we do buying is spying and um, so uh, so uh, so the question is uh, for you I mean what you advise uh, as customers 
to do. That's a really tough one. You know, yes. I um, I think it actually just got much worse because of the EU VAT directive on this, where you know, worried about Amazon dodging its taxes through Luxembourg, uh, the EU has said now if you sell a digital good to anyone in the world, in order to make sure that they're not a European who owes you VAT, you have to gather two non-contradictory pieces of personal identifying information that geographically identifies them, which have, means you have to personally identify them, and then you have to retain that for seven years, which is to say that ev like everyone now has to log huge amounts of PII, which again, will not it's not if it leaks, it's when. And, um, you have to do that for non-Europeans as well as Europeans. And then there's the additional bother of trying to, um, you then have to figure out which of 26 VATs to apply to each of them. This is just a, this is just a, an accounting problem, but it does keep the SMEs out, the small and medium enterprises out, because the burden of figuring out which of 26 VAT rates to, to apply to ebook sales and then applying it correctly and then filing 26 VAT returns every quarter just means that basically Amazon can afford it, Google can afford it, but I can't. And I was, I'm building an ebook store for my own books to do a kind of humble bundle style thing. And I've just basically stopped work on it right now because after spending tens of thousands of pounds on it, because I can't comply with the EU VAT regulation for a total of what would probably be three or four hundred pounds of VAT a year, I would have to spend 60,000 pounds in accounting <coughs> compliance and gather PII on everyone, including non-Europeans, in order to do this. This is a huge problem, and it is insurmountable in the EU without action from the EU. I understand why the EU did it. They don't. They. They. they first of all, they don't want Amazon dodging its taxes, and second of all, they don't want. Um, if they, they. They. understand. I think correctly that ebook is such a nebulous, dis, nebulous category that if you said ebooks are VAT exempt but games are not, then every game would become an enhanced ebook. You know. Uh, so it's it's tricky, but I think that they that they solve this problem, which is a real problem, in a way that is not a solution. It makes things worse. So actually, I avoided his his question. So 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 uh, perhaps using the, the, the good old uh, good bad cap good cap strategy, I will uh, again try to <laughs> squeeze it up from you because because from you know my business point of view, I, I I wanted to make this point sooner or later at this conversation that even you as an author who promotes you know privacy and and so on, even even you cannot avoid, afford the luxury of not having the iTunes or Amazon link on your own website. Sure. Because just just abandoning this channel of this will be suicidal to you. I, I wonder if you could just perhaps uh, give some number, a rough number of how much how, how much of your income come from great EU corporations, how much of your income could come from humble bundle. You, you, can, can you say that? Like, Sorry, say, so I'm not sure. Like how that? much comes from affiliate money or how much comes from Amazon sales? Yes, in, in terms of percentage, how much, how much can you... Can well, I don't you know how much of my books come from Amazon sales overall. I can, we can take a book like Little, or Little Brother. Do we do Little Brother as a... As a I think we did Little Brother in Humble Bundle. We certainly did Homeland in hum Humble Bundle. So Homeland uh, sold 200,000 hardcovers at, in the US at about a $2 per book royalty. It sold about 100,000 paper paperbacks now, again, at about a dollar royalty. I got about $60,000 from Humble Bundle uh, in that one package. Uh, and then there are other subsidiary rights to Homeland, like, uh, uh, well, so I spent, for uh, the audiobook, I spent about forty thousand dollars recording the audiobook. Uh, I got about that much back from Humble, and then so that was a wash. But my and my agent took a fifteen percent commission out of that, so it actually I lost. Money. I didn't expect it. But then I, but then I, I mean, it's hard to know. Like I don't, I don't have the numbers like exactly, exactly. But it's probably on that one book about a quarter of my income. It's hard to say though. Um, but the point is that I was in fact working on solving this, right? I was I, I had a service that wasn't going to log you, where you could name your price for my ebooks, where I would be a retailer for my publisher, so my publisher would get their money back. The code base was going to be GPL'd and freely available to everyone. And the EU has basically made it impossible for people like me who are trying to find an answer to this to find that answer. So my answer to you, if you want to buy ebooks anonymously, you have to leave the EU. Uh, it's true. Right? You cannot buy ebooks anonymously inside the EU legally because the EU requires everyone who sells ebooks inside the EU to um, block 
uh, to, to, col to collect two pieces of VAT and retain them for seven years. Suddenly I, I begin to think of, of dystopia when you have tax-free tax and, uh, and, 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 and snooping-free uh, bookstores on airports, like you, you just go via... Yeah, exactly. Well, you know, like I would, it's not even a matter of being tax-free, I would happily collect 15% or 20% VAT on every book I sell and just remit it to the British government and let them figure out who gets it, no problem. Right? Still not like a huge amount of money, cheaper than building the accounting compliance. The problem is I have to figure out whether you're in Poland or in Germany or in the UK and I have to log that for seven years in order to, in order to sell you the book. Right? It's, so at the very least what I've done is I've made all my books available as free downloads, which you can download from the Pirate Bay, which I think we can agree probably isn't logging. Right? You can download it from the Internet Archive, which I assure you isn't logging because there are 501c3 with transparent IT practices. Uh, you can download them from other sources that are anonymous. Now, as soon as you want to give me money, I have to keep track of you for reasons that I completely disagree with, but that are out of my hands and that are not technology questions and are in fact not even related to the surveillance business model except glancingly in as much as they're about stopping um, tax shenanigans from uh, multinationals, which include Google and Amazon, but also include Starbucks, right? It's not really an IT thing. Just, just, just... To, to make it, to, to, I, I still, I, I still fail to, to, to understand the, the consequences. Does it also work in, in a way that if I download your your book for free and then simply send you ten dollars by by PayPal? I, I asked my accountant about this and she said yes. <laughs> yeah, yeah. She said basically once you if you are if you are saying give me money for this book even if it's naming your price even if it's after the fact that that money has to have VAT collected on it. Because otherwise, Amazon could do the same thing, right? Amazon could say, well, you downloaded the book, and then we coincidentally took $10 out of your, out of your uh, uh, MasterCard, and now, you know, like, it, you know, the two facts are, you know, correlation does not apply causality, right? They're correlated, but, you know, who can say deterministically whether or not they're related? I mean, it's no weirder than the idea that the IKEA licenses its trademarks to a nonprofit in Switzerland, and therefore doesn't have to pay any taxes because it, in fact, once you've paid the trademark royalty in every jurisdiction, no IKEA in any country makes any profit. All the profits made by a nonprofit in Switzerland that makes that pays a three percent tax. I mean. What you've identified is not an IT problem. You have identified a problem with corporatism and out of control, neoliberal, multinationalism. And that those problems are more important than our problems of IT, as are problems of, of racial injustice and gender-based injustice and so on. But the thing is, those fights will be won and lost on the internet. And so keeping the internet free and fair and open is not the most important problem we have, but it's the most foundational one. Because every other one of those problems can only be solved by fighting them on the internet. I, I, I didn't expect I will leave this conversation being even more pessimistic <laughs> than I can hear. I was expecting to hear something from you that would perhaps say to me, oh, maybe it's not that bad, maybe there, huh. there, is, there is some... Oh, like, like in your novel, it seems so simple. You just, you just you know, print your 3D printer on the 3D printer and welcome the world of... They of... go to jail in my novel. They lose in my novel. <laughs> they get beaten up in my novel. They, you know, they have to go underground and live in Mexico in my but novel. But still they use technology which is not even... Uh, which is that, that is not, it's not here yet. But... Well, they use Tails, basically. I call it Paranoid Linux and it didn't exist when I wrote it, but now it exists and it's Tails. And it's apparently scary enough that according to the deep packet inspection rules that were leaked uh, by Laura Poitras in Spiegel, that if you if you search for tails, your data is permanently retained. Your searches, all your stuff is now a targeted search by the NSA, and it's permanently retained, which suggests that the NSA thinks that tails works. I think I think this is this is your what you were saying before, which is that there is a problem with having someone who isn't encrypted, and it's this: mm -hmm. if tails works, or GPG works, or OTR works then you have this, this graph that looks like this. You send me an unencrypted email, because you're my friend who doesn't use encryption, and it says, there is this sensitive issue that I think we should be dealing with. I send him a PGP email that they can't read. Then he sends an email to a third person that says, I just heard that there's this sensitive issue. From that, if they're retaining all of our communications forever, and all of our communications forever, because I use crypto sometimes, then, the, then they can infer everything that happens in the crypto cloud by what the cloud ingests and emits. And I think that that's totally right. It's not the Facebook problem you were describing. It's a different problem, but it's related. And I think that 
that that is, in fact, one of the reasons that we need simple ways for people who have sensitive issues to discuss them with us. So I wonder if, if your startup is already set as a security threat by, by any your... Uh, like, oh, I'm sure. I yeah, no, I, 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 mean, I don't think it's like the Tails rule, though. I think that the Tails rule was too much. Like, I think that they, that they basically... Like, one reason, one way to understand, ta like, the, the uh, mass data retention is not just as surveillance or paranoia, but also as, as um, corruption. Right, like, like we, we're getting all this stuff about what James Clapper was invested in when he was the head of the NSA, like now his investments that were held in trust are coming to light. And he was investing in the companies that were winning these contracts, right, who are now paying him a million dollars a month to advise them, right? So it's, it's like, I think one of the reasons that they're doing mass, da mass scale data retention is not because they want to spy on us, mm -hmm. but because they want to award contracts to their friends and get kickbacks, right? Like they, they're, again, interrelated, and I don't think that that means that they won't spy on us with them, but again, like security analysis starts with good threat modeling, and the threat model, it, you know, one of the vulnerabilities in the, you know, on the other side of the mass surveillance ecosystem is attacking the corruption instead of attacking the paranoia. Well, actually, my favorite example of, 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 of how, how far it, it went and how bad it is is, is from the Snowden revelations was, was that uh, some, some employees of the NSA were using, were using this technology simply to spy on, on the ex, girls. Or the ex uh, or, yeah. or, or just this nice girl. Yeah, like love it. Yeah, yeah. love it. Yeah. I mean, if I was, a, as a writer, I think that that's a great topic. I, I'd like I agree, and I raise it often because of nothing else. So I think that just as the security forces would have us believe that jihadis are 100 foot tall, you know, giants, ninjas with that shoot lasers out of their eyes. And like, we must, you know, if there's a jihadi in the room, it's like Ebola is in the room. It's like the mask of the red death. Uh, in the same way, I think that we are prone to mistaking the security services for being these all powerful, all knowing, hyper competent. And when you actually read the this, this stories from inside, the, the paranoid organizations are irrational, right? Like, as I said at the start of this, Cardinal Richelieu, the problem of the, of the security organizations is in part that all of the things that are inconvenient or embarrassing about you might come to light. But the other part is that they might just incompetently ascribe guilt to you, right? When you have a thousand page long US no-fly list, there are not a thousand, unless it's typed in very large letters, there, there cannot be that many jihadis in America. Otherwise, America would have fallen already, right? <laughs> And so what, what we're left to conclude is that the security services are, not, are often not very good at their jobs. And so one of, the, one of the existence proofs of that is that the security services, part of their argument is you can trust us to spy on everyone because we only look inside the black box when something bad is happening. And the existence proof that you can't trust them is on the one hand, Lovent, and on the other hand, Edward Snowden. Right? Like if everybody who works for the security services is totally trustworthy, explain Edward Snowden. Right, uh, And so I think that the existence of Edward Snowden is actually the best argument Edward Snowden has for curtailing the surveillance apparatus because for every Snowden that came in out of the cold because he was a public interest oriented individual who kept a copy of the Constitution on his desk, there, there may be another five who are doing Levant or worse. Right, who are working for the mafia, who are working for the Chinese, yes, who are working for whatever. Right, And so this is an absolutely great reason you know, Anton Chekhov said, if you put a gun on the mantelpiece in Act 1, it will go off by Act 3, right? If you give the security services all of this information that can be used to fuck us in every conceivable way, you must assume that someone will eventually use that to fuck us in every conceivable way. Well, uh, so <clears throat> please say something optimistic for, for so I, I, I'm not going to tell you something optimistic. I'll tell you something hopeful. And I, I, uh, this is what I say when people ask me about optimism and pessimism, is that optimism, science fiction writers should never predict the future because it's like drug dealers who sample their own products. It never ends well, right? <laughs> Instead, science fiction writers should try to influence the future, right? Should try to inspire new futures or give us toolkits to understand the future. And pessimism and optimism are, are both predictions, right? They say that regardless of what's going on now, the future will be like X or it will be like Y. And I believe that the future changes based on what we do, that we impact the future. Otherwise, why would we get into bed in the morning, right? That, there, that the future is different based on our interventions today, that the, the most important thing to do is not to predict the future, but to predict the present, because the present is the moment at which the past becomes the future, right? And what happens in the present prefigures the future. And so rather than being optimistic or pessimistic, I think we should be hopeful. And hope is why, if your ship sinks in the middle of the sea, 
you tread water. Not because you have a reasonable expectation of being picked up by a passing ship, but because everyone who was rescued treaded water. It's, it's a necessary but insufficient characteristic for changing your situation, right? And if there are people around you who aren't as technically sophisticated as you, who don't have the power to tread water the way that you do, who, don't, who can't use technology as well as you can to push back, it's like having someone who's with you when the ship sank who, who runs out of energy before you do. You don't let them sink, you hold on to them and you kick twice as hard. And there's this great American cartoon called The Tick uh, that ran when I was a kid. It was a superhero cartoon, a satirical superhero cartoon. And there's this one bit where like a villain is going to destroy the earth. And Tick says, don't destroy the earth, it's where I keep all my stuff. Right? And the earth literally has everything on it and everyone on it that we care about. Right? And some of those people and some of those institutions are not capable of kicking back as hard as we are. And so, for the same reason that we would kick twice, twice as hard to keep our friends afloat, we will kick twice as hard to change the world, to keep them afloat. Not because it will automatically be a better future if we do this, but because it will automatically not be a better future if we don't. Right? So being hopeful is something that is worthwhile. Being optimistic means that you can stop kicking. Right? Being hopeful means you have to keep kicking. And so that is, that's my message to you, right? Screw optimism, hope is much better. Okay, so, <laughs> so just, 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 just to hold on to this, to this hope, can you, can you tell us more about this startup, this technology, and can it give, give me hope? Like, because I, I will use it only if it's just you know, plug and forget. Yeah, I so it's not a startup, it's, just, it's, just, it's a foundation, it's a non-profit. But there are a bunch of startups that are doing this, right? There's uh, like, like Wicker, which you know, I, I'm an advisor to them, and they, they have a thing that looks just like Snapchat, except it has real crypto. So it works exactly like Snapchat, except it's zero knowledge. Crypto, Wicker doesn't know what's in it. Um, they can't be compelled to disclose the keys. They have a warrant canary, which is when you every month you publish whether or not you've been told to change, uh, to give, been given a secret order demanding that you change your technology to weaken it. And then if you're given that secret order, you just don't publish that month. And so people watch, you know. So the, 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 the way that American constitutional law works, America, I mean, the American constitution, just like its, its plaintive side, no win, no fee lawyers, are vastly underestimated by foreigners. For its, for its versatility and utility in fighting these things, because impact litigation gives you a totally different attack against back corruption than mere than, than legislation, right? Because you've got you just you have a different institution you can fight in. If when the legislature stops working, you can fight in the judiciary. And the jurisprudence in the judiciary is that it's much harder to compel a company to lie than it is to compel them to silence, right? So you can compel you can compel silence, but not falsehood in American jurisprudence. And so the belief is that there's at least a colorable claim that um, if you were compelled to lie, that you could, that a court would would uh, not enjoin you to follow that law. And the law doesn't actually require you to lie. The law, the law requires your silence. And so not publishing is silence. So they have a warrant canary. They have audited code. And the EFF just published a scorecard. And there are some areas where Wicker fails. They're not open source. And I think that's a huge problem. And one of the, my advice, one of my pieces of advice to them, which they may or may not end up following, is being open source, which would make certainly make it a lot easier to tell whether or not they've been compelled to change their code in a way that we can do. Um, that, that all of those things put together give you a thing that looks exactly like Snapchat, more or less, but instead of being like Snapchat where it's bullshit, actually works. And so Snapchat, for a long time, I thought that Snapchat didn't work because I didn't under understand its security model, which is I thought that Snapchat was for sending things to people you didn't trust that would then auto-destruct. And actually, that's not what Snapchat is for. Snapchat is sending things to people you do trust who you think might be lazy or sloppy or imperfect. Right? And so what you want is for their device to automatically do what they might forget to do, which is delete sensitive information after it's been viewed. And so, like, like Snapchat, Wicker doesn't pretend that it will stop you from making a screenshot or taking a picture with another camera or remembering what was in the message. All it does is trust that if you lose your phone or you know, if your phone is t taken from you by the police or whatever, that none of that information will be on there and be, will be viewable by anyone, including them. And so I think that's, like, that's a great example of the kind of technology that we can build that looks exactly like the technology we're already using, except isn't bullshit.
But they will always be this problem. Sorry to, to, to keep with my cynicism. That uh -huh. why do you why do I use Facebook? Why does he use Facebook? Right. Because everybody is on bloody Facebook, right. and that's the only reason. Yeah, yeah. And uh, the same reason is why teenagers use Snapchat because others. And I'm afraid that nonprofits and you know the people of with good hearts and good minds and so on will never. Well, Wicker is a for profit. Wicker is a for profit. The, the, the nonprofits, the ones doing the front end that's for it, you can beat the fact that everybody is there. It's it's just you no. Know, well, but at one point nobody was on Snapchat. Actually, the reason. Teenagers use Snapchat is two Snapchat is twofold, uh, threefold actually. The first is because their friends are there. The second is because their parents aren't there. And the third is because the operational security benefit you get from using Snapchat. Well, you've got two of the three with Wicker already, and you know the methodology for growing an IM a messaging platform is well understood. It doesn't most of the time it doesn't work. But we know how it works, right? It grows through Metcalf's law, it grows through network effects, right? You make it easy to invite people in. You know, uh, Moxie Marlinspike, who has developed a, a free and open source Wicker-like technology for, for messaging, does a much better job. It sends you a, if you send someone an SMS that you want to be encrypted, instead of sending them the encrypted message, it sends them a link that then installs the, the, the suite that keeps the message secret. And so, like that's a that's a really nice way. Like it, it just basically piggybacks on WhatsApp and and Snapchat and everything else. Instead of sending people instead of sending people messages using insecure channels, you just send them a, an invite to a secure channel. And so that's a nice kind of viralish way of, of growing. I hate going viral the phrase because it, it's used interchangeably with becoming popular. But I think that like there's a difference between becoming popular and actually having a popularity mechanic where popularity begets popularity, which is what I think Moxie is building. I like the, your sarcastic way of saying bacterial instead of viral. Yeah, bacterial <laughs> instead of viral, that's right. right. <laughs> yeah, okay, so I, I, I think it's probably the right time to uh, actually uh, give you all of you the voice and, and sure. poss possibility to ask the questions. Um, um, so, who has a question? And I'll remind you, a long rambling statement followed by what do you think of that is technically a question, but it's not a good one. <laughs> okay. Should I use mic or can I, I, I can, I'll repeat your question okay. if you, if you uh, shout. I, I was just wondering um, if this problem you're describing about uh, the VAT in uh, the European Union, uh, it should be possible to solve this through a digital single market. and. Uh, if I remember correctly, new VAT rules are going to come into place uh, on 1st of January. And I was just wondering if you are familiar with them and yeah. if they would solve some of them. So problems. the question is, does a digital single market solve that? And in particular, the January 1st change, is that what's going to do it? No, the January 1st change is the one that makes me collect. That is the thing that's making me collect from everyone. So having a harmonized VAT rate would make some of the accounting a little easier. But it was the, the, the argument that... This, and I don't know how we resolve this in the European context, that the state where the good is purchased in the EU deserves its share of the VAT, and that you have to retain records in order to, to, to um, make that happen, and that those records need to be precise and non-contradictory. So, like, for example, you could retain the first two quads of the IP address, and you could do statistically significant allocation of VAT without, doing, without retaining PII. Right, like so, I just save half the IP, the first half of the IP address, and send money to countries based on that. But that's not the accounting practice the EU has stipulated. The EU has stipulated two non-contradictory, fully qualified pieces of PII, so that we can collect it. Having one rate of VAT would also make this easier, but not much easier. The real problem is that is having to retain, and then the issue for me as a European is that the I think the only way I'm going to be able to make this thing work is if I geo-detect whether you're in the EU and don't let you buy, right? Because then I don't have to retain any PII, which sucks. Yeah. Yeah. We right? Fix that. So I'll do an inbound gate that says, like, are you in the EU? And if so, I'll just send you to a web page that, you know, the Pirate Party can maintain about fixing VAT problems. <laughs> and, and, and otherwise, I'll sell you the book, right? I mean, I don't know what else to do. It's terrible. Yeah, I mean, as a European, this is terrible. To, uh, a service that lets you fake your IP address. Yeah, or, or yeah, exactly. I don't know. You, I, I don't know if that would, if the HMRC, the tax man in the UK would come and, you know, stick me in the Tower of London for doing that. <laughs> yeah. Can you tell us more about uh, Simply Secure that uh, you mentioned earlier? Because uh, I thought that was, it was uh, kind of a source, uh, initiative, and it 
Yeah, so how is it that Google and Dropbox are, are backing Simply Secure? So it's a 501c3, so all of its funders are, are known, and they include Google and Dropbox, but it builds GPL code that does end-to-end -end crypto. So I'm not sure, my impression of uh, looking at this is that basically senior people at both Google and Dropbox as a condition of going to work for them said you have to fund my pet project. Um, but the point of end-to-end -end crypto is that it makes services that you don't trust trustworthy because you know, if you know what the endpoints are doing and they're free and open source and you can see how they work and you, then, uh, and you know that what they're doing is scrambling the message so that it's cryptographically validly scrambled, then you also know that people, on, uh, that people who are in the middle of the transaction who are not just Google and Dropbox, right? Those aren't just the adversaries that we're trying to address. We're also trying to address the NSA, which is also in the middle of this transaction, regardless of who the funders are, that you will have end-to-end -end security, right? And so uh, it, it's, um, you know, it's, it's weird, but, it, but as far as I can tell, and as, a, as an advisor, and I'm not a board member, so I don't have fiduciary duty to it, but I'm privy to the Articles of Incorporation, as you can be too, because as a, a 501c3 charitable nonprofit, all of the all of the Articles of Incorporation, the salaries, the funders, they're all on public display. And then as a as a GPL code shop, all of the code is in GitHub, uh, and all the check-ins and all the all the chatter are also in GitHub. So you can see if, if all that's going on, that gives you at least um, some insight into it. I mean, Tor came out of the U.S. Uh, Navy Office of Intelligence, right? that the whole point of having a good um, development methodology is that you can, you can substitute transparency for trust. So you can have independent audits that substitute transparency for trust. And since you need independent audits, regardless of whether you, not, you trust the person, because as you, as, to go back to where we started, right, is this incompetence or malice, right? It doesn't matter to you, right? Like if, if there's a problem in OTR, it doesn't matter to the OTR user if they were compromised by incompetence or malice, but it does matter to how you solve it, right? And so what this does by having fully auditable code bases and fully auditable check-ins and contributing to a project that multiple entities contribute to because we're making the front end, not the back end for OTR, you now get um, a, a system where you can, in the case of either malice or uh, uh, in the case of, um, uh, of, of incompetence, de detect these errors. And since we know from, from Heartbleed and from sh uh, Shellshock, that errors can lurk undetected for a long time. We need that auditability anyway, right? Uh, it's, a, it's crucial to it. And in fact, one of the core devs in the group and one of the board members and founders is a senior Google cryptographer named Ben Laurie, who's also on the Apache board and is an open SSL key maintainer uh, and who has a very long and honorable name in free and open source software as well as crypto uh, circles. He and his brother Adam uh, operated the bunker, which was the UK data center that was located in an old nuclear bunker, uh, and has he's done lots of really significant, uh, uh, well liked, widely respected crypto projects. Yeah. Hi. Um, I have a comment and a question. The comment is about everyone's on Facebook. Mm -hmm. I find it a bit annoying. Everyone's not on Facebook. I check data and phone around forty percent is not. It's a big user base you can kind of inoculate. Mm -hmm. Admittedly, the, the teenagers are there and so on. And Once their parents get to Facebook, they'll leave them. But so here's my question. Um, the group that's not there most significantly are the youngest children. They're simply not using the technology. Uh -huh. And I know you have an interest in, in you know, work educating children. Um, young adult novels are for teenagers. Do you have a strategy and do you think it's possible to move lower, you know your daughter is I guess kindergarten age. Yeah, well so my new, my, the question is about what about younger children, so the comments about Facebook and that younger children aren't there, 40% of polls aren't there, and then the question was about what about younger children. So um, to answer the second question, my newest book, my second newest book now is a graphic novel called In Real Life Aimed at Middle Graders, so 12 to 14, although people who are older like it. It's doing really well. It's sold out its first print run, number three on the New York Times bestseller list this week, so it's doing great. Uh, and um, there are a bunch of European editions, not a Polish one yet, but the, I'm just booking in like a trip to, for the launch of the Spanish edition this spring. And so it's, 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 it's going to be in lots of other places, and it's based on my story, Anda's Game, which became my novel For the Win, which is a book about labor politics and video games. 
Um, and so certainly I've written work for younger kids. Uh, I think that there, are, there have been some great technologies aimed at younger kids that are really about seizing control of the network. Actually, I think the best work that Mozilla does these days is not maintaining Firefox, although it's my browser of choice. It's, it's webmaker stuff aimed at really young kids. They do amazing work. If you ever go to a maker fair, the Mozilla stuff is the most interesting stuff there for, for small kids on the software side. Um, and I mentioned already makerkids.ca and other maker spaces aimed at small children. And then, of course, there's Scratch, which is fabulous. Uh, and I think that view it, that there's like a media literacy question that if you view the internet as bi-directional, malleable, and changeable according to your whims, then it's much harder to shove you back in the box of being passive in relation to it. Um, it's a bit like if you've read Piketty in Capital in the 21st Century, which I apologize if you've heard me banging on about this for the last two days because it had a profound effect on me. One of the questions that Piketty raises is, are people who've had three generations of being of, of assuming that they lived in a mobile middle class where like doing better would let you earn more money and gain more station and you know who you were born didn't where you were born didn't determine your social status forever um, will those people be willing to go back to the peonage that characterized pre-modern uh, pre-redistributive Europe um, or do you have to have already come from multiple generations of peonage to accept peonage as your as your lot in life, and in the same way, I think that like if you grow up understanding that computers are things that you open up and reconfigure, and that software is something that has a view source button, um, will you be willing to will you be willing to accept it? And that's a question I don't know the answer to, uh, but I do think that people have often characterized there being a kind of generation gap where those of us who grew up with computers that invited us to open them up and make them work, in fact, demanded it. Um, are affronted by the sealed hermetic tablet, whereas the people who start with the tablet may never feel like they, sh they have the right to open them up. Wait a minute, I, I, I just jump in with my pessimism. Yeah. The, the problem with the generation gap is that we are actually, the, it's the other way around that people might expect. We are the, the last generation perhaps who remember days when your computer really did what you told him to do and I mean right. really obeyed. And now for, for, for the younger generation it might be only natural that you don't control what's on their iPhone. Well, I, I think we're in agreement here. That's what I just said. That's why, that's why Scratch is important, but, right? But that's again, it, it, it gives no hope really. Well, except that Scratch is, is Scratch is like the most widely adopted tool for uh, media literacy in classrooms around the world. But that's exactly you know Boy Scout stuff. You you do this Boy Scout stuff, and then you learn to be adult, to, to drink whiskey, and to to, to swear and do all the things that well, well, like we say in Polish, you have to uh, grow up from. You have to learn to wear up the adult pants. The Russian scrutiny might have right. At some moment, you just can no longer be a Boy Scout. Then you realize that this is the real world. So this this is the this is the question about peanuts. Right, like this is the you know my wife used to work for a broadcaster doing video games. She worked for Channel Four, which is a public broadcaster, and she had this huge fight with her boss once. She ended up leaving, and the the one of the uh, not over this fight, but she ended up leaving kind of over this attitude. And her boss said, "Oh sure, when you're in your twenties, you want to play around on the web and socialize with people and do stuff. By the time you're thirty, you're so beaten down by the world. All you want to do is fall down on the couch and turn off your mind and watch television." Uh, am I this boss? No, no, but it sounds like my long lost quick brother. But here's the, here's the question is, where, what did all of those people who supposedly this is the natural state of being, like I think that we fall into this, this trap of assuming that what was done since we were children, I, I think this is what you're accusing me of, that we assume that what we've done as I'm children is the natural order of, of humanity, but vegging out in front of the television is an extremely modern phenomenon, and even more so in the post-Soviet nations, where obviously like like television viewing options were a lot more constrained than in the West. And television was better. So no, we love <laughs> our... Maybe this is just the difference between uh, uh, between uh, someone of, like, of a long experience of working in a big media corporation and someone working in an NGO. Actually, I find out that there is a lot of uh, 40 years old uh, Boy Scouts around me and uh, or trying actually to make a world yeah. better. Uh, don't, don't go too much into that. Well, it's better than like, it can go one way or another, right? So like there's this guy, Mr. Jalopy, who wrote the Maker Manifesto, you know, if you can't open it, you don't own it, screws, not glues, all the rest of it. And he's um, uh, a guy I know, lives in Los Angeles, uh, and he's a hot rod builder, he builds cars. Mm -hmm. 
and he lives uh, in East Los Angeles, and uh, he goes yard sailing. You know what yard sales are? Garage sales? He goes yard sailing in Burbank, which is a neighborhood that was all post-war, 1945, all the houses were built. And he goes every weekend, every Saturday, uh, and it's Los Angeles, so there's no winter, right? So that every Saturday there's one of these. And he's been to about half the houses in, in there by now. And um, everyone who bought those houses and they're built, they're all dying like this year, pretty much. Like by this point, like it's sort of 80% mortality and everything in their houses are being sold. Now he's a tinkerer, he's a mechanic. And what he's discovered is every single one of those houses has a workshop in it with a full set of well-loved, well-used, not abandoned, beautifully used, beautifully maintained tools. So there was a time and a place in which it was absolutely normal for everybody to have a workshop and, and tinker with things. And if that circumstance is at least possible, then it is not inevitable that that circumstance will never arise again, right? I mean, it's at least, it is at least one of the ways in which the human condition expresses itself is for every house to have a garage with a, with a, um, uh, uh, a workshop in it. It's not the only way, it may not be the dominant way, but it is within the realm of, of things that we know have existed, right? Like you can't argue with, like we can argue about whether something that we've never seen might come into existence. But we can't argue with things that have actually existed, whether or not they could exist. We know they could exist. The way that we know it is that they existed, right? So maybe, well, maybe tinkering, maybe vegging in front of the television, these are both very modern phenomena as we understand them. Um, what we know is that now we have networks that kind of supercharge both of those things. So if you want to fix something, if something is broken and you want to fix it, you type in, how do I fix this? and you find some video where someone's made of them fixing it or a message board where they said, I looked at that video and it didn't work, what did I do wrong, and so on, right? Like fixing has gotten much easier, but also finding a, like a video of someone putting a lemon in his nose has become easier. And so both of those things have become easier. Which one of those things we do, I don't think is foreordained. So this is hope versus pessimism or optimism. I don't believe we'll automatically get tinkerers instead of lemons. But I, I do think that we can intervene on the side of tinkerers. Okay. Yeah. Um, I think that Poland is quite a young country because Poland, as we know it right now, has only 25 years old. Mm -hmm. And I think the problem is with this generation gap that uh, the older generation uh, is used to being used by the government, like to not have them their, their rights. Uh -huh. And in Poland, it's very common for the people to not fight back. Like uh, we get got a ticket, for example, yeah. and it's not fair because something is something. And the people is okay. It's only fifty slots. I played, and in the internet, it was uh, at first the same because there was some examples of people who just sent an email, an email to other people like you use this service you have to pay according to this point of the agreement that you clicked like I am really blah 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 yeah, yeah, yeah. and you have to pay us like 20 slots or something like that for just using it and they w there were some people who were like cr crazy scared because it was if you don't pay we will arrest you and, yeah, yeah. and the people, people paid this money and it was all of uh, it was a scam. Like, yeah, it was a big scam. And I am wondering how we can do this to change people's minds. Yeah. Like from that, like you said that, uh, oh, we can't win with Google, we can't win with yeah. big companies. Because I think that every people, every person, uh, sorry, has it's their rights. And sure. We sure. We sure. We sure. I don't know how we can ter turn the thinking on the other side in Poland to just think like, like you, like right. we have our rights, we have to fight and... So, so the question or the, the comment, the intervention is that Poland is new, as we understand yeah, it, 25 how, years old. we can change right. thinking in and our country. And there's a certain Sovietified fatalism. Yeah and obedience and an a, custom, a, a certain customary deference to the state and to authority and an expectation of a baseline of corruption and when things are unfair you just assume that you have to go along to get along. Uh, and how do we intervene to kind of awaken a spirit of egalitarianism and justice? Is that a... a, a yeah. So, uh, I mean, obviously the Polish character 
is runs a gamut from this kind of I mean even the the Sovietified character I you know speaking as a Russian Polish Romanian Ukrainian Canadian uh, <laughs> that that uh, Belarusian that um, the Soviet character includes a certain kind of dour rebellion that takes the form of just not giving a fuck, right? Like just, just sort of like if someone asks you to do something, you do the least credible thing you can do and then you just walk away from it. I mean, this is like, this is a, my, my great aunt in Petersburg was a uh, engineering manager and you know, her, her like crew would just get drunk, right? They would do the least work they could do to kind of like not get fired on the spot and then they would just go and get drunk. Right, there's a kind of passive resistance, a passive aggressive kind of resistance. So that's one kind of resistance that we should like, we shouldn't mistake going along with being passive because there are ways to resist even in, in passivity. And then there's also obviously within the, the Polish, modern Polish identity, Lech Walesa, right? Like it's not like the reason that the post-Soviet Poland emerged is because the Poles passively allowed their government to dismantle itself, right? It, it arose out of popular, you know, mass scale populist uprising. I, was, I had an interview beforehand where someone was telling me about solidarity strikes that I'd never heard of, where the uh, one union goes out not on their own behalf, but on behalf of another union that would get fired if they did. And so like, like this, is, this is brilliant. It's like credit default swaps for labor. It's, you know, it's, like, it's, like, it's like financial engineering for workers. It's amazing, right? And so clearly that is also in the Polish character. And like every, every other country, the character of Poland is a complex one that reflects passivity and action, uh, uh, aggression and, and um, uh, f fellow feeling and all the rest of it. Uh, and bringing out people's... Um, people's activist, you know, justice fighter, sometimes I think uh, you need to find a way in for them. Like I was saying before about Scratch. Scratch, one of the things that I realized, so I played with Scratch as an adult, waiting for my daughter to get old enough to use Scratch. And I, and I thought, oh, it's a cool little programming language. I used to do stuff like this when I was a kid. And then I sat my daughter down in front of it, and I tried to interest her in like the way the code worked. Totally uninterested, right? And then we were clicking through all the different demo apps, and there was a disco dancing app where it just played a music loop and three sprites moved, two sprites moved back and forth on the screen and rotated between different sprites. And she said, can I change them? And I was like, yeah, yeah. So we click view source and there's a, a graphics editor that lets you do bitmap editing, right? So she found this way in that was a thing she was interested in. She spent two days just changing the bitmaps of these sprites. And after ch and when you could just click run and you could see them running as you edited them, right? It was kind of like you did something and something changed really quick. And then after two days of doing it, she said, Dad, how do I change how they move? And then I showed her the code, right? And so giving someone an easy way in, and this is why I think the, the critique of clicktivism is wrong. Because if you give someone an easy step in, if you give them something in now, a lot of people will take that first step and then walk away. But the every deeper commitment starts with a smaller commitment. And asking people to make a giant commitment at, at first is a really big, it's a hard sell, right? If your first commitment is come down to the central square, bring a gas mask and a helmet, you might go to jail. The number of people who show up will be smaller than if your first step is sign this petition. And maybe most of the people, definitely, most of the people who signed the petition will not come down to the central square with you. But once you have people signing the petition, you can give them something a little more in depth to do, and a little more in depth, and a little more in depth. And speaking to someone who organized in the world before the internet, I was a, an anti-nuclear proliferation activist in the 80s, that giving people an easier way in gives you an opportunity to deepen their commitment in a way that like having no first step makes it much harder. You exclude whole ranges of people from action if you start very low, uh, or very high rather with that first step. So having a low first step is I think an, a, a really important activist tool. I think the trick is that you need a thing that follows from the petition that's not just another petition. And that's where you have to be very creative and find other ways to get in. Yes. Okay, uh, I would like to ask you to ask Charles Strauss 
not to abandon science fiction for urban fantasy. <laughs> <laughs> because, well, he wrote... Uh, yeah, he wrote this, The Future is Magic. Well, Future is Magic, well, well, this is exactly the point. Uh, well, I got a problem with this, uh, you know, presenting technology as magic, because it, it can be mastered, but magic cannot be really understood. Right. Right, so, well, the question, probably, would you rewrite, I don't know, Little <coughs> Brother or For the Win as urban urban fantasies. So, will it work? So what, first of all, will I, will I make Charlie Strauss change his mind about writing fantasy? You know, I wrote a book with Charlie Strauss. If I could make him do anything, that book would have been different. I can't make Charlie do anything he doesn't want to do. Uh, so if I could just wave a wand and win arguments with Charlie, that would have been a totally different book. Not necessarily a better book, I want to say, but a different book. I'm, I'm in no sense responsible for or capable of directing Charlie Strauss. I just want to get that out of the way. I have written an urban fantasy novel. I wrote a novel called Someone Comes to Town, Someone Leaves Town. And it's an urban fantasy novel about a man whose father is a washing, or his mother's a washing machine and his father is a mountain. And he's raised by golems. And his siblings, one is an island and one is like an immortal undead uh, vampire and one is a, a clairvoyant. Uh, and so on, and he moves to Toronto to build open wireless networks, right? <laughs> so I don't think urban fantasy precludes dealing with questions of technology and technological ado adoption, um, and nor do I think that technology is necessarily masterable, because I think beyond the trivial, that technology is subject to the halting problem, that, that um, uh, it is so sensitive to initial conditions and is blown by so many weather patterns in the world of technology, that the, the technosphere is so complex that we don't steer it, we try and um, direct it. You so know? it's like, like a force of nature for you? I, there are elements of technology that are like a force of nature. Kevin Kelly wrote a very good book about this called What Technology Wants, where he tries to demystify the question of technology as um, being dri driving itself. But then again, you could say the same about corporations and government. They, oh, I think corporations. Like, like, like forces oh, I here. totally agree that corporate. I think what corporations are best understood as, and like why movies like The Matrix are popular, uh, is that corporations are immortal, transhuman uh, life forms for which we are the gut flora. We are the intestinal flora of corporations. This gentleman on the right, well, look at his reaction. This is exactly. What uh, he agrees. I totally agree. So have you? We have. Things happen with our gut flora that change us, right? Like, like, you know, you know what's the, the only the only uh, Polish I ever learned from my grandmother? Cholera paskutsva, right? <laughs> it's all about gut flora. Gut flora has a huge impact on the on the organisms that it is that it that it is parasitic upon. Okay, so I've got one, 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 three, There's another person waiting for a question over here. Yeah, all right. I also like to ask you about science fiction because I don't think we've uh, received uh, the seminal post Snowden, post NSA, post uh, WikiLeaks near future science fiction novel. I think we've gotten close, but I don't think we have one seminal book which we, we could point to that would update perhaps Neil Stevenson's uh, cryptonomic into the post Snowden, post 9 11, post economic <laughs> crash age. And I think you're getting close. I think that Charlie Strauss's halting state is getting close, and perhaps. William Gibson's pattern recognition and a spooked country, but perhaps you could point to some other novels. With what's which what's a good novel that's a good post Snowden science fiction novel? So uh, that that kind of tries to capture yeah, like cryptonomic near future. Like near near future. future yeah. So so um, Gibson actually has a new book out called The Peripheral that is set both near future and far future and is a absolute work of genius. And in fact, you can think of it as a dialogue between 1990s Gibson and 2000s Gibson. Uh, wonderful book. I, I have a review of it that went up uh, recently, uh, and I thoroughly commend it to you. It is an absolute work of, of genius. Um, what other books? I think Paolo Bacci Galupi's new book, which is a young adult novel, um, which is called uh, The Doubt Factory, is a really good book about some of this stuff. Um, let me humble brag briefly, because I'm so chuffed about this. Uh, if you watch Laura Poitras' documentary about Snowden, he has a copy of Homeland with him in Hong Kong, mm. which is super exciting. I mean, of course, now I take credit for the whole thing. Now, um, <laughs> I actually think Laura, Laura actually, I think, brought it to him in Hong Kong in case they needed a book code because it's, it's like, where would you find a book that's all about leaks and crypto? It's, you know, so like it would be a good book for finding a book code in. Um, 
what else is good in that regard? Stevenson's next book is not about this. I just saw him in Seattle, and that's not what he's writing. I don't know that anyone else that, that, that's come along. I'll tell you, though, judging from the PR pitches I get for reviews, every single publisher wants the book that I they're publishing this season to be a personal book. book. I don't want any book. I want yeah. the seminal work, which would perhaps replace Cryptonomicon as the book. Peter Watts could write Peter that. Watts maybe could write that, yeah, write yeah, or Madeline Ashby. Um, yeah, I don't know, I don't know. I mean, I, there are lots of uh, surveillance state books, for sure. I mean, I wrote this novella called The Thing That Makes Me Weak, The Things That Make Me Weak and Strange Get Engineered Away, which is kind of a cross between Stevenson's Anathem and Cryptonomicon uh, that tries to get at some of the, the surveillance stuff. And I wrote another one called Chicken Little that's about um, the kind of Thomas Piketty singularity. I actually think that if you really want to tell the Snowden story, you have to tell the Thomas Piketty story. I had a big argument, uh, discussion, friendly argument with my editor at First Second, which does my graphic novels, because they do brilliant adult-oriented nonfiction graphic novels. And she was saying that she wanted to do like a Snowden for, you know, like a, a understanding Snowden kind of graphic novel nonfiction title. Her husband runs the, cryptography, the crypt, cryptographer's mailing list. So she's very clued up on crypto. And I said that, like, I don't think that you can tell the Snowden story without the, the Piketty story, because I think one of the ways to understand mass surveillance is that historically the ruling class has weighed the cost of redistributive policies as a means of maintaining social stability against the cost of guard labor and surveillance to maintain social security. And they try to find an equilibrium where they give away as little money as possible and make up the difference in redistributive policies and make up the difference in surveillance and guard labor. Uh, because it's pretty unquestioned, and like this is absolutely clear of places like say China or Ethiopia, like nobody would argue that that is anything but the system that exists in these countries that we think of as non-democratic, non-Western states. And I think that the way to understand the Western states is that IT has made surveillance and guard labor so cost effective that the uh, top 10%, the top decile, are able to retain much more of their earnings and substitute for redistribution, guard labor and surveillance. And that actually Snowden's journey from being a kind of fire-breathing libertarian on the Ars Technica message boards, who, you know, free markets and the Bill of Rights, to a kind of much more nuanced adulthood with this huge revelation, I think ties very closely into that. And I think that the, the two are, are, can't be disentangled. But actually now, the, the, the novel that, the novel where Snowden meets, meets Piketty is, I think, a Ready Player One. What do you think of that one? Oh, With that's some interesting. Nostalgia. Oh, sorry. No. Yeah. Uh, yeah, I, I, I think, yeah, Ernie Klein certainly does a pretty good job. I don't think that it's, um, that Ready Player One is about um, surveillance as much, though. Uh, it's, it is certainly about corporate control, but it, I don't think that he nails... The private private public partnership. Well, the first plot twist. The, the first plot twist is actually about the main protagonist realizing how much he's being surveyed. For. But but, uh, so sorry, no, but, it's, but it's but it's corporate surveillance. I think it's a little different. You're right though. That's a wonderful book, and not just because like I appear as a character in it. It's a that's a great <laughs> book. Should we uh, should we wrap for lunch and <laughs> deface some books? Oh, okay. Are we signing to GDP? Uh, yes, although I'll tell you, the last time I tried this with Seahorse, it didn't export for some reason. So I signed it, I exported it back to the MIT server, and this, the, the signature didn't come up. It might have been a problem with the MIT server at the time, though. You gave me a card to sign, you're not in the MIT, your, your key is not retrievable from MIT. Why? Yeah. I checked the uh, email address three times, so go and check. So yeah, I'll do it. If you give me your uh, fingerprint and let me see your ID, uh, I will um, I will sign your your key when I get a chance later. Yeah. It seems that's even it's even better than having a signed copy of your book. Well, and you know the other thing is that if you um, if you want me to sign an ebook, you can just email me the text of it and I'll reply to you, and the the message will be PGP signed. So you can, you can get a PGP signed copy of any of my books that way. You just paste the, paste the body into an email. Whoa. OK, so thank you very much for participating. Right. Thank, thank you. you very much for answering Thanks all for the having me. questions. Yeah. And, uh, and yes, it's, it's, it's time to, to wrap it up and go for lunch. Thank you. Thanks, everyone. Thank you very much. Very brave of you. Very good of you.